For your visiting here for the first time, a warm welcome. My name's Steve. Uh, I'm the vicar, as you saw from the video. I need to lose weight. That's all I can say. One thing when I watched it, it was like, put on a bit there. <laughs> Flatten some grass in my time, would we say. I get to lead this church with my lovely wife, Liz. And we have done for the last five years. And... Vision Sundays, it's a bit delayed because last week I was away at uh, King's Cross Church, KXC, one of our sister churches speaking, but um, Vision Sundays is a time to reset, to remember what God has done in the past and what he continues to promise to do, to repent when we've not pressed in like we should have done, and to reset and recalibrate. So lots of R's today. So we've got to remember, repent, reset, and recalibrate. We remember that this church was planted in the 13th century. And so it's been here for many centuries, and thousands of people have gathered here. But five years ago, we came to revitalize a church that's already here and partner with that church. And from 40 to 50 people, that's grown to over 300 on a Sunday and probably 400 to 500 in our community across that. And so we remember and celebrate that. We are coming up to our 1900th uh, baptism. Special prize if you're the 100th baptism. So anyone want to be baptized next time? Uh, not really, but we're coming up to 99 adult baptisms. And so things like that we remember and celebrate. And that's incredible. But Vision Sunday, as I said, is a time to reset, recalibrate, and get back sometimes on track. And we do it every term. So I'm just going to Psalm 17, 7. Just read a little bit of scripture as we start. And then we'll look at some of the other scriptures that we've remember have been given to us as a church and what Liz and I and the team have pressed into in this week and see as the future for this term. Show me the wonders of your great love. You who save by your right hand those who take refuge in you from their foes. Our first and first most fundamental need as human beings is to be loved. We arrive in the world needing to be wanted and cared for. And then as we grow up, the human heart's heart wants to be accepted and affirmed. We seek purpose, relationship and intimacy. As human beings, we fear isolation and loneliness. In some ways, our whole lives could be defined as a search for love. And for many people, there seems to be a lot of love around. For some, less so. For some, more so. There's parents, there's partners, there's friends, there's even strangers from the internet. A hit or a like or a view. And yet, yet even the best expressions of human love are always somehow inadequate. Even the best parents don't love us perfectly because they're human. No group of friends or romantic relationship or level of popularity seems to ever be quite enough. At the heart of the vision statement of Church Crawley here at St. John's is the word love. But it's not the worldly love. We love Jesus. We love church. We love people. We love Crawley. This love is a much deeper, richer love. A Christian love that is intimate, of fellowship and action rather than feelings. It's based on this, that God loves us for human love is always imperfect, partial, conditional and temporary. Whereas the God that loves us with, the love that he loves us with means that we're loved totally, unconditionally, perfectly and eternally. Totally, unconditionally, perfectly and eternally. And it's not a special club, it's for those who turn to Jesus. And each are invited into that love today. We love Jesus because in his love, Jesus, we see the deepest expression and proof of God's love. On the cross, we can see that the crucifixion of Jesus is a sign of God's love 
and their very demonstration, their very definition of what it means to be love, to lay one's life down for another. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And so we have a demonstration of that love, and that is the heart of the vision of St. John's, to, to be looking to the cross continually. But if we have a demonstration, we also have an experience of that love through the Holy Spirit. It's a personal experience of love where we can have the head knowledge sometimes, and then we need the heart knowledge too, the experience of that love. And that's through the Holy Spirit. So that when we say we love Jesus, we both love is both demonstrated in fact in a historical event, but experienced by the power of the Holy Spirit moving in each and every one of our lives. That's why we say we love Jesus, love church, love people, love cruelly. Yet to be loved as human beings is to be real, is to be vulnerable, and is to be open. It's a risky business to offer yourself to be loved and to love others. We can feel at the end of ourselves burnt out, vulnerable, and just done in. To live with the vision, love Jesus, love church, love people, love Crawley, can be costly if we do it under our own strength. But God is calling people with vulnerable, open, honest hearts. C.S. Lewis famously wrote in his book on the four loves, the quote's going to come up, there is no safe investment. To love at all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will certainly be wrung and possibly be broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give your heart to no one, not even to an animal. Wrap it carefully round with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket or a coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable. The alternative to tragedy, or at least to risk, the risk of tragedy, is damnation. The only place outside heaven where you can be perfectly safe from all the dangers and perpetrations of love is hell. Love is to be open and to be vulnerable. So to know the breadth, the depth and height of the love of God is our deepest longing. And yet to love is risky and costly. And to love Jesus and love church in today's world is costly and seemingly irrelevant and not worth it. It could be uncomfortable and inconvenient. But it's the only thing that gives you life. It's the only thing worth giving yourself to. As I told our story last week in KXC, I was open and vulnerable about our story, but it's about the love of Jesus coming in when our marriage seemed to be over. That's the love that restores and heals. That's the love that we pursue here at St. John's. We live in an age of anxiety, fear, loneliness, of consumerism and shallowness, of little capacity and little meaning. Of do whatever feels right and you'll be happy. And yet time and time again we see in the stats that happiness and connectedness is at the very lowest point. People are unhappy, isolated. So on Vision Sunday at Church Crawley at St. John's that we have each term, I want us to remind us again and again, because as we'll see, we forget and we don't remember that the main thing is Jesus. The main thing is Jesus and there's love. To reset, restart, recalibrate. I don't think we finished from January. I really don't. I think we've been distracted or consumed. We get back to our lives and we don't pray and fast as much as we did. And we remember those times and we think, oh, that was a glimpse. I think we're being called still to continue, to renew, refine, restore and rest from the encounter vision of January. I think God is refining, restoring and calling us to remember again. As I said last week, I was speaking at KXC and story of faith and it always exhausts me a little bit but always reminds me of the grace of God that I felt when I first became a Christian. It takes me back to my first love, Jesus, the one who saves. That I lived a life 
I barely recognize or remember before Jesus. And through his love and his grace that I've been set free and saved. Then in the lowest moments of life, he stepped and redeemed me from the pit, as the psalmist would say, and restored, renewed, and revived my life. And in the business of church, the institution of church, the business of programs and consuming of things that are not of him, I can easily lose awareness of that story, of my story connecting to his story, and to forget that that story is happening every day in my life, and I'm becoming more like Jesus if I keep him at the center. That he continues to redeem, restore, refine and renew me through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now I can become distracted and consumed. And I need to keep him the main thing. That's why encounter is, a culture is so important to the church. It's a decision as church to continually step back into and step into his presence. Into his transforming story of love. For help us to keep us focus on him. We are to always to keep Jesus at the centre. To lift our eyes to him. When all around us seems to be calling us. Distracting us. And tearing us apart. We come back to Jesus. We come back to hope. It might be in a hospital room with a diagnosis of a loved one. Or the words of harm spoken by others about us. Or the fear of safety in a warring world. Or the insecurity in the economy or the breakdown of relationships. The storms of life. We must stop talking to Jesus as much about our problems. And start speaking to our problems about how powerful Jesus is. So we can tell that there's a God that can change everything. Whatever mountains of life, however mighty and powerful they will seem, the love of Jesus is always the answer. And he's an awesome God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And what does it look like for Church Crawley in this season? The answer to the problems of the world is always Jesus, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But it's always the local church. It's still plan A. Jesus hasn't given on up on us. And we're not to give up on him. However imperfect the church is. And we make mistakes continually. And we make mistakes here at Church Crawley. Because I'm your leader and I'm human. And I'm Steve. But it's still the place that he chooses to use the people of God. You and me to build his kingdom. Beautifully flawed human beings. In Crawley, a beautifully flawed and maligned by others place. Where people have no idea often of the love of God who has trapped and imprisoned them. They need church and local churches. That's why I love your neighbour here at St John's and 26 churches. It's crucial because it's not us just being the answer to Crawley. It's all the churches in Crawley that speak the gospel of Jesus Christ. So today, just as we unpack for a few minutes and reset, recalibrate and repent a little, I want to look at our why. Remind us of our why here in Crawley, at Church Crawley and St John's. Our motivation. I want to talk about who is called to do that mission here in Crawley and what that mission looks like and how we do it in this season. The why, the who, the what and the how. The why. The why in our lives, as Simon Sinek, if anyone's read that book, The Power of Why, I Start With a Why, will tell you. It's what gets you out of bed in the morning. It's what motivates us and directs our time and energy. The most important resources we have is our time and energy. Working hard for something we do not care about is called stress. Working hard for something we love is called passion. And passion will keep you going. In the police, when I recruited a new member of the team, I'd ask, and I'd always ask, I just want you to care deeply. Do you care deeply for what you do? To have the right why, purpose, vision in your life, do you care deeply for the work you do the people you serve, and to keep the people of London safe. If you cared, 
if you had a why that I could connect with and we could connect with as a team, we could forgive anything, any mistakes, because we knew that you cared. It's the same today in church. Uh, why must come from caring deeply, compassion, that gun-wrenching love of others. For as Christians, we have an awareness of our brokenness from the cross and that Jesus died for us and he loves us. And God loves us so much that we're called in our deep imperfections, brokenness, to really care for his kingdom and be kingdom builders. And for us at Church Crawley, the central verse of the kingdom building has always been Isaiah 61 verses 1 to 4. The spirit of the Lord is upon us. Because the Lord has anointed us, he has sent us to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. It's the passage that Jesus quotes as he opens up his adult ministry in Luke 4. It's the passages that were spoken over me when I was baptised in the Holy Spirit when I first became a Christian. It's the words that came again and again as Liz and I discerned if we were being called out of the police into church ministry. It's the words that are written in my office by my beautiful Grace, our oldest daughter, on my office wall as a Christmas present in my study. It's the words that keep uh, keep us going when we've had people live in our house that we need, saw needed to be set free. It's the words that continually remind me of my own journey of freedom and to be set free again and again. It's why we do Alpha that starts on the 27th of May. Invite a friend to freedom. Invite a friend to be not oppressed anymore. That's what we're inviting them to, to love Jesus. It's not a course we invite. It's a relationship to have. That's why we do the character school, is we want people to be set free from their addictions, set free from their idols, and step into their true identity and character in Christ. It's why we do home groups, huddles. It's why we do courses, the bereavement and marriage course, to see people that are mourning and oppressed set free with the love and life of Jesus. So it starts with Isaiah 61. If you're going to pray anything in this season, pray these verses that I'm asking us to look at today. Isaiah 61 verses 1 to 4. And then there's Psalm 24 verse 3. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? I'd love to, is when I read that. I'd love to, but I don't think I'm worthy. Those who have clean hands and pure hearts, I definitely don't feel worthy now. Who do, not, who do not lift up their souls to what is false and do not swear deceitfully. I'm counted out. And so all of us are, except for the blood of Jesus that qualifies each one of us. I said this story many times. It continues to inspire me. It continues me on Vision Sundays to make me read the book about the Hebridean revival of 1949 to 53. Here are the words from Duncan Campbell about what happened in the Hebrides. I say it as a story to inspire us today to think that it could happen and dare to believe it could happen here again. One night God gave one of the sisters, these two elderly sisters in their 80s, a vision. So if you're in your 80s, God's not done. And if you're any younger than that, God's really not done. Now we have got to understand that in revival, remarkable things happen. It's supernatural. You're not moving on human levels, you're moving in divine places. In the vision, this sister saw the church is crowded with young people. And she told her sister, I believe revival is coming to the parish. At that time, there was not a single young person attending public worship in the Hebrides. Not a single person. And she had a vision of a church full. A fact which cannot be disputed. Sending for the minister, she told him her story. He took her message as a word from God to his heart. 
So let's be open to God speaking to us through 80-year-olds or whatever, or young people as young as five. Turning to her, he said, what do you think we should do? What, she said, give yourself to prayer. Give yourself to waiting upon God. Get your elders and deacons together and spend at least two nights a week waiting upon God in prayer. If you'll do that at the end of the parish, my sister and I will do it at the end of the parish from 10 o'clock at night until 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. We need to raise our game, don't we? (laughs) So the minister called his leaders together and for several months they waited upon the Lord in a barn among the straw. During this time they pleaded one promise, for I will pour out upon him that is thirsty, and floods upon dry ground, I will pour my spirit upon thy seed, and my blessing upon thine offering, from Isaiah 44, verse 3. This went on for at least three months. Nothing happened. But one night a young deacon rose again, reading from Psalm 24, Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He hath clean hands, a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, different translation, nor disworn deceitfully. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord, the righteousness from God of his salvation. Closing his Bible, he addressed the minister and other office bearers in words that sounded crude in English, but not so crude in our Gaelic language. It seemed to say much humbug. To be waiting as we were waiting, to be praying as we were praying, when ourselves are not rightly related to God. Then he lifted his hands towards heaven and prayed, O oh God, are my hands clean? Is my heart pure? Then he went to his knees and fell. Now don't ask to ex- me to explain the physical manifestations of this movement, because I can't, but all this I know, that something happened in that barn, at that moment that young de- deacon repented. There was a power loosened that shook the heavens. An awareness of God gripped their gathering together. Powerful repentance. For us at Church Crawley, I believe that he's calling us to be aware of our brokenness. Prepare to tell real, honest, open, vulnerable stories. Awareness of our sins when we've got it wrong. And willing to repent. Which literally means turn back to God. That to have clean hands and a pure heart. And not about our actions and giftings, but his grace and his love. Though we can't earn it, but we're given it. Grace is that love outpoured. Faith is accepting that despite our brokenness. These oaks of righteousness spoken in Isaiah 61. He is calling us together, both individually and corporately. And press into him like never before. In church, in home, and our secret places. In St. Richard, St. Peter's, and St. John's. In prayer, worship, and fasting. That's why the character school that begins in September is so crucial. It's where we look at our story and connect with his story. Where we check our motives and think how we're recalibrating. The encounter evenings, teachings, and rules of life that change lives by encountering him. Why? Do we do what we do? It's to be set free like Isaiah. And we're called to set others free. Who's been called to set, be set free and set others free? Every member of Church Crawley and St. John's. And what season are we in? It goes back to the words we stewarded in September in Exodus 14:14, 14, 14, To stand firm and allow God to fight for us. That's where our strength comes from. It not comes from us, but from him. It comes from being in his presence and from that place we go out and serve where his presence is also there. But it's an awareness as we come together that we get dirt under our fingernails, but they get cleaned in the presence of the Lord. It was Psalm 27 that we lingered on. Phil came up in one of the encounter evenings and I preached about last time we spoke about encounter back in January. Psalm 27 verse 4. One thing I asked of the Lord that I will seek after to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. So why why is to set people free? The who is each one of us. And the what is to come and seek, dwell and gaze. In the encounter sessions 
in the morning and the lunchtime and the evening. To keep us centered on why and who we follow. To be builders of the ancient ruins means as oaks of righteousness, we must be fully rooted in Jesus. So that's the who, the why and the what. And as I come in to finish, the how. Jonathan Mortimer. We all like a word from Jonathan. Jonathan's here this morning. A hey, reverend. But we all like a word from Jonathan. But he gave me a word this week or just at the end of last week. Which really, oh, Saturday it was. Last Saturday. But I stewarded it. I prayed into it. And I think it's a word for me. I think it's a word for me and Liz. I think it's a word for the church. It's in some ways been the hardest part of our ministry here in the last few months. And in many ways, we could not have survived without encounter. I think because we are stepping towards God, things come in our way and take us away from God and distract us and consume us. But the blessings of encounter have been intimacy relationship whilst we've had the trials of the world, be it in hospital rooms, in synods and funerals of friends, or church offices where there's tears, confusion and fear. But I still think we're in a time of refining. With Jeremy Jennings down this weekend, who is the HTB leader of prayer for the last 30 years, and not knowing what me and Liz were going through, said to us, I think it's a season to be seasoned. Because he's got great things on the other side. I said, I'd rather be on the other side. It's a great time to be seasoned. And the word that came from Jonathan just helped me think about the, that actually we're not trying to get just onto blessings, but in life there's always blessings and there's trials and they go together. And the, the words was from Psalm 103, verse 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and do not forget all his benefits. Which was the bit that Jonathan really sort of pushed into. Or who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good as long as you live so that your youth, this is what I liked, is renewed like the eagle's. Anyone sees my football playing, you need it to be easily renewed by the eagle. And just to say, notice, football's on this Monday. Anyone sign up? Got it in there. <laughs> the book of Psalms is a book of poems. Songs that tell us about the condition of our human heart. They're not general principles, but they're like a counselling casebook of the human heart. They're not a textbook, but a series of case studies of wrestling of every emotion, anxiety, fear, loneliness, anger, or shame and guilt. I came to faith wrestling and reading these case studies. In the world of uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, or AA, well, there is a book called The Big Blue. And it doesn't contain the 12 steps but of principles of freedom, but it, it contains stories of how people have wrestled through the principles. And psalms are a bit like that. Yeah, there are a few psalms that aren't about wrestling, but general principles of how to face life. And that's Psalm 103. If you open it in your Bible and you see it, you'll see it's very differently titled. It's, not, it's just called the Psalm of David. There's no mention of the situation or the historical events it's written in. And when I tell you the principle that we live our life by, that it contains, you'll be underwhelmed because it's really, really simple. Its key is verse 2, just as Jonathan centred on. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and do not forget all his benefits. Or other translations, remembers all his benefits. In Hebrew poetry, the Lord and remembering or not forgetting his benefits are the same thing. It's a continuous act. It's not two things in these verses. Bless the Lord on my soul and all that was in me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord on my soul and do not forget his benefits. It's not two separate things. They're a continuation. It happens together. The NIV shows it accurately as a dash. So the main thing in life is not to remember God's love. The main thing in life is to remember God's love. 
The problem with the human heart is that we forget God's love really, really easily. The remember of the Bible is so much deeper than our shallow English word. It's not just mental recall or counting our blessing that this psalm is talking about. It's remembering the deep story of the gospel in our lives. It's remembering the awesomeness of God and the way that he stooped down in Jesus and saved us. We spoke a few weeks ago about Moses drawing us out of the water, water, but he drew us out to be drawn into God's presence. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. In 2 Peter 1, 8 to 11, it says to us, you know, I've not time to go into it now, but it talks about needing patience, needing self-control, needing perseverance and courage. And what Peter tells us is we shall remember again and again that our sins are are, have been cleansed by God. The word from remember in the Hebrew is deep. It's to have the story of our salvation so central in our minds continually. That's what those words mean in the Psalm 103. It's to have our story of salvation and redemption and rescue so deeply in the center of our minds that it changes our behavior. How many times have we let one negative comment take away a hundred words of affirmation? I have. How many times have we said that, you don't know what I carry, Steve, and I would say this to myself, the images I've seen or the words have been spoken over me in cruelty, I will linger on them and stay with them. Just one, way more than I would of the hundred words of affirmation of God in my life. Let's linger on his truth, not the lies of the world. So in the past months of trials, we have seen incredible blessings too. And I think I could cast a vision of opening a new building in September, of new ministries, of new things. But over the next few weeks, I could ask about giving generously, joyfully and sacrificially next week. But as we step into the next few weeks and months, I think we're being called to be focused on him with Jesus at the center. Our why, Isaiah 61, to be set free and set others free. The who, each one of us. The what, to come and seek either individually or corporately and gaze on his beauty. And in this season, I think we're called to worship. Worship more and keep our stories of salvation and freedom at the forefront of our minds, even when we don't feel it. Because I think that's a battle cry. And I think the devil flees when we worship. And we're called in this season to step forward and be worshippers, standing firm in his strength. Amen.